Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. If you happen to click on the link that I sent around with my sort of reminder email this morning, you may be seeing my name, Stephanie Irvin, appear under your box. If you could take a minute and use the three dots box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to rename yourself um, for who you actually are, that would be great. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. I see we have Zev here from the State of Safety in Oregon. Thanks for joining us, Zev. You're welcome. And Penny from Ceasefire, Oregon. Good to see you, Penny. Great to be here. Thank you for hosting this. And I think I see Paula Barnes, who is one of our chapter team leaders in Washington State from the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. It's good to see you, Paula. Thank you for your work and for joining us today. We're going to give it just another minute for folks to settle in find their Zoom link and join us. Again, if you clicked the link that I sent around in my email forward today, then you're probably seeing my name, Stephanie Irvin, instead of yours um, under your uh, participant box. If you could go ahead and use the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to rename yourself for who you actually are, that would be great. Okay, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining us. So we're going to get started. My name is Stephanie Urban. I'm the political director for the Alliance for Gun Responsibility here in Washington State. We really appreciate people taking the time to be with us today for this important topic. Um, I see that we have folks from across the Pacific Northwest with us. So please take a minute to introduce yourself in the chat feature and tell us who you are and what organization you're from or group that you're a part of. Um, we want to see who's with us. So if you could use the chat function at the bottom of your screen um, to tell us who you are and where you're coming from in the Northwest, that would be great. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge that here in Seattle, where I'm uh, based, we're on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish, or the first people of Seattle. And even though I'm in Seattle, my co-hosts and many others participating um, on this call are um, in communities across the Northwest and are on historic lands that are not from the Duwamish or Salish people. Um, if you're interested in learning more about land acknowledgements or what native lands you might be living or working on, we're gonna share a link that you can go to in the chat to learn more about that. So I think Thomas is gonna throw that in the chat if you're interested in learning what native lands you live or work on. Um, I also wanna thank Thomas while he's doing that um, Thomas Wheatley from Oregon, who has done the lion's share of work bringing us together today. So thank you, Thomas. Um, and Chelsea from our team at the Alliance for Gun Responsibility is working the Zoom features and the slides today. So thank you so much for your help, Chelsea. And let's see, I see some folks actually using the chat feature to tell us who they are. Maureen from the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Um, Zikra from Portland, Oregon. Thank you so much for joining us. Bob Brown from Portland, Shalom Social Justice. It's good to have you here. Um, oops, I just saw Liz McKenna, Legislative Committee Chair from Lift Every Voice in Oregon. Thanks, so great to see you, Liz. And so many other wonderful folks are participating. Thank you, please keep populating the chat um, with who you are and where you're from if you're just joining us. Um, we're really excited to have you all with us today. Um, we have some really great speakers lined up, and we're definitely going to reserve time at the end for question um, and answers. And Jen, uh, my co-host, is going to get us started. Hey, great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, my name is Jen Lynch. I know a bunch of you, but not all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, in uh, my day job, I am a, a partner to Venture Capital Fund, but for the last eight years or so, I've been a volunteer working on um, the gun violence prevention and gun control movement, and I am one of the founders of the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety. So we all know that guns are used explicitly as tools of violence and intimidation. But more and more, um, and especially in the last several years, uh, this is including this has included threatening peaceful protests, um, threatening community leaders, and threatening elected officials sometimes in their place of work. Uh, and of course, um, guns have been used to 
um, you know, intimidate and forestall the peaceful transfer of power in election results. So our discussion today is going to dig in um, to what we know, uh, what our experts know about these movements um, as sort of sparked and driven by the far right um, and how extremism and militia groups in the Pacific Northwest and nationally um, are using existing gun policies as a wedge in policy debates uh, and what can be done about all of this, what we can do to um, stem this tide of armed intimidation, protect our communities and public buildings and hold armed extremists accountable. So before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, we're gonna keep everybody on mute. If you have questions, um, either put them in the chat, I'm gonna keep an eye on that um, and or um, send those to me personally. Um, I, you know, I've sort of given the speakers fair warning that I may interrupt them if they, we need them to clarify some um, specific topic. Um, and then also in the upper uh, right-hand corner of your screen, there's an itty bitty button that says view. If you keep that view on side-by-side -side speaker, then you'll be able to see who's talking along with the slides. So you're not um, stuck staring at a PowerPoint screen for the next hour. That's not fun for anybody. Um, and we will hold time for more Q&A at the end of the session today. So um, again, please use the chat. We're gonna make sure we build in some time to talk at the end um, and, uh, and give you some time to sort of have a dialogue with each other as well. Okay, so first I'm gonna introduce um, Rachel Goldwasser, who is a research analyst at the Southern Poverty Law Center's Intelligence Project. Um, she tracks right-wing anti-government movements and shares her expertise with a variety of stakeholders. Um, you can find her writings on the SPLC website. She previously worked in Homeland Security. Um, thanks, Rachel. Let's uh, let's go. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jen mentioned, I work for SPLC's Intelligence Project. Uh, we track extremist groups from across the country. I specifically look at extremist groups in the West, although I also um, am responsible for nationwide groups, which include uh, sovereign citizens, constitutional sheriffs, QAnon adherents, and some others as well. Um, I was born on an Ohlone land, actually, in California, and I now live on the land of the Porch Creek Indians, which is in Montgomery, Alabama, and I am she, her, hers. So thank you for having me here today. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about, I've essentially penned 2020. Our past year is year of the armed citizen vigilante, which is very unfortunate. Um, one of the things that SPLC was seeing, uh, myself in particular, is that there were armed citizens as well as extremist groups coming out armed uh, to various events, events throughout 2020. So as you can see on the PowerPoint, these were gun rallies, coronavirus stay at home protests, often protesting health guidelines uh, mandated by state governors. They were counter protesting Black Lives Matter protests or also coming out for election related protests, including, for instance, Stop the Steal, which is the, the main protest um, on January 6th. And all of those events, unfortunately, um, and sort of the trend toward coming out at events, um, you know, with firearms in hand is something that culminated in what we saw in DC on January 6th at the insurrection. Next slide, please. And so in 2020, SPLC tracked uh, extremist groups and individuals that were either hosting, attending, or promoting protests across the country of various types, as well as other events and incidents. What we found is that there were over 60 protests this past year where there were armed groups and individuals that showed up to them. Um, very specifically, armed extremist groups. So again, this isn't all extremist groups. These are only extremist groups that came out with guns uh, that we could see, um, not even people that were, you know, uh, carrying uh, concealed, um, showed up at 11 different gun rallies, at eight different coronavirus stay-at-home protests, and at four election-related protests. And these are 2020, so obviously those protests also uh, were occurring in uh, 2021 as well. And then there were so many uh, counter protests where people showed up armed to Black Lives Matter protests that in fact we counted it by protest versus by group. So there were over 30 different protests where various individuals and groups, including extremist groups, came out armed, um, 
often to intimidate protesters. Um, some of them claimed that they were protecting businesses in the area. Some were coming out based on conspiracy theories about Antifa showing up to destroy their towns. Um, this happened very, very often in the Northwest. So I've listed some of the areas where that did occur. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about why this is a clear and present danger. Uh, the first one is that extremists are using these major events and incidents as recruitment and marketing tools. They are getting their uh, information out there. They are making sure that the public is sort of aware of, of what they believe. And they are also making sure that they can find people who wanna come and join them. And unfortunately, this is fairly successful tactic overall. Um, thankfully, there are prosecutions from January 6th, which hopefully will sort of stem the tide and the trend that we've seen in that direction. Um, it's extremely unsafe for citizens. So this includes protests. Obviously, we saw that. If you look at the picture uh, that I put up, this was Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, who was in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He came out with his brother and some other militia, militia supportive people to go supposedly protect businesses. And the next thing you know, protesters have been shot and killed by Rittenhouse. Um, it's you know ruined his life, obviously, and even more importantly, it has ruined and destroyed the lives of not just his victims, but their families and friends. Um, it's also unsafe because there are standoffs. That's one of the reasons that we list anti-government groups at SPLC, is that very often extremists, their ideology leads them to be angry at the government and other citizenry, and they take it out by using weapons, including firearms, um, to hurt and to kill people. Um, we saw in Nevada in 2014 in Bunkerville, Ammon Bundy come out with his family, um, very specifically with arms pointed at uh, BLM, which is the Bureau of Land Management. And now Ammon Bundy is in Idaho, not just running for governor, but he's just extremely dangerous because he has a very large group, many of them who are firearm um, supportive. <coughs> Excuse me. And they also have done paramilitary training within that group and work with other militias. It's also unsafe for democracy. Um, you know, I think, I think none of us really would feel comfortable going out and assembling um, and sort of practicing our free speech and right to assemble if we think there are people with guns who are planning to shoot us um, when we go out. And so it really does have a, a really negative, uh, dangerous effect. Politicians, as Jen mentioned, have become targets in the last year, both at their homes and at their offices. They Many times people are going out and protesting them, but they're also intimidating them with weapons that they're carrying. Um, lastly, free and fair elections, which Jen also mentioned, um, are a major issue, right? Uh, it's, it's scary to go out and vote, for instance, if you think there are gonna be people there with weapons. Um, it's also, you know, what we saw on January 6th, that's really a threat also to our electoral college and our votes in general. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, how this event that occurred in Richmond, Virginia in 2020 has sort of had a cumulative effect all the way up through 2021 and possibly beyond. Um, so in January 20th, 2020, there was a rally that was pro-gun. It was put on by a group called VCDL, which you're probably many of you aware of. Um, and it was during lobby day, but the event itself was uh, a rally that was held um, with numerous extremists involved, even speakers, uh, for instance. And many militias also showed up to sort of hold their own march as well, which they called Militia Monday. You can see uh, from some of the pictures, some of the people that showed up, that is the head of the Proud Boys, Enrique Tario on the top. There's more Proud Boys on the right, along with Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist who we know was perpetuating conspiracy theories around Sandy Hook. Um, there are the Oath Keepers, that was them on their way into Richmond, Virginia, and a picture of one of the militias that was fully dressed out and also carrying weapons um, at the event. So what happened there, uh, for time, I'm just gonna say this very briefly, although it's a, a major issue, unfortunately. Um, the first thing was it was the public debut for the Boogaloo movement. You all have probably seen them in their Hawaiian shirts. They essentially believe that a uh, revolution is necessary. Most of them believe a violent revolution is the way to go. 
Um, they are two way supportive to the extreme, literally. Um, and there have been many, many acts of violence and planned acts of violence perpetrated by Boogaloos in 2020. Um, it started a Second Amendment sanctuary movement. Again, you all I'm sure are aware, so I won't say a lot about it, just that counties sort of have created amendments which are mostly legally toothless, saying that they will not enforce any state or federal gun laws um, that are uh, any bills that are passed essentially in the future. Um, it kicked off militia musters, a lot of them promoted by extremists, where individuals and extremists were coming out and deciding to create militias that specifically were going to defend against either state and or federal government employees, essentially, um, if they ever tried to enforce gun laws. And of course, this could be other laws as well. Um, and it also paved the way for constitutional sheriffing. Sadly, there are many constitutional sheriffs in the Northwest. Um, they essentially believe that they have the highest level of law enforcement authority. And so what that means is they think they have more than the president, more than the governor, more than the city council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what does that mean in terms of danger? It means that they're not going to enforce laws. That's what they're saying. And when they work with militias that were created by these militia musters and by pre-existing militias, as well as other extremists, um, and they work with their counties who have passed these sanctuary amendments, which I believe is about 60% of the counties in America. The end result, right, is sort of a powder keg. That's what we're looking at. Um, so I hate to doom and gloom you, but they're essentially January 20th kicked off sort of a storm that everybody who is sort of looking to stop uh, gun violence is going to have to work incredibly hard to sort of prevent. But there are measures which we'll talk about hopefully a little later. Thank you. So all. Rachel, um, yes. that, that um, last statistic was remarkable. As you know, Oregon has a number of Second Amendment sanctuary counties, um, and one of those um, uh, sanctuary designations is working its way through the court system right now here in Oregon. But I think you said 60% of county. Can you repeat that statistic? That was sure. mind-boggling. 60% of counties in America um, are said to be a Second Amendment sanctuary counties. So we recently got that statistic. The, there is some question in terms of there's not that exact data uh, from the people that put it out, but we have also actually seen that ourselves multiple times because there is data readily available that sort of it's fascinating because these, you know, these have all been passed at the ballot box here in Oregon because um, we make that process relatively easy. And I, um, you know, I, I, I imagine um, Washington State has kind of a similar environment. I, uh, I'm wondering if you know of any. Um, so as you know, as you said, this is getting. There is some legal pushback here in Oregon. Are there other places where um, groups or states or you know? Uh, attorneys general even are, are, are pushing back on Second Amendment sanctuary um, laws I, or policies, I, I guess, sure. I sort of say what this is, you know, when you, when you create this de designation. Yeah, so the really great news, as I mentioned, is most of them are legally toothless. Mm -hmm. um, they actually won't stand up in really any court in the land. Um, there are a, a few variations on that in the way that um, I think some, some of the text uh, can be used, but essentially in those cases, attorney generals can't do have the uh, capacity to essentially fight against it. Um, so that is good. And again, it's, it's just minute pieces of it that are potentially enforceable as opposed to, you know, there is no supremacy <laughs> among the county, even if a constitutional sheriff wants to tell you there is. Um, and so as a result, um, if this, if, if someone wanted to fight it, I think there, there's extremely uh, po great possibility that they can not just fight it, but win as well. Um, if anyone's interested, we actually wrote a blog that's on the hate watch on our website, which is uh, splcenter.org, um, specifically about Second Amendment sanctuaries. We spoke with every town for it. And we also spoke with ICAP, which is out of Georgia that is working specific, or I'm sorry, ICAP is, is out of Georgetown. <laughs> Um, and they are working specifically on paramilitary laws, both at the state and federal level currently. Okay, fantastic. Um, I am going to keep us moving, but you know, stick with us, Rachel. Um, everybody who 
um, is introducing themselves in the chat. Thank you so much um, for doing that. It's great to see who's here and, and thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to move on to Eric Ward um, and Rachel will be back when we do some more questions and answers at the end. Um, okay. I'm sure he will pop up here any second now. Um, Eric Ward is the executive director of the Western State Center. Um, and he is an expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and uh, you know, their role in um, you know, in in a in a in participative and inclusive democracy. Um, Eric also serves as a senior fellow with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward, and he is co-chair of the Proteus Fund. Um, thank you so much, Eric, for joining us, and I will let you take it away. Such a pleasure. Thank you for the invite. Uh, it's such a pleasure to, to be with everyone today. I know we're talking about a, a, a heavy conversation, and I, I heard uh, Rachel's call uh, uh, to put uh, uh, the positive piece. If, if there is a positive piece about this hard moment we're in, uh, it is uh, the truth that uh, the push for inclusion, uh, not only in our region, uh, but nationally, uh, is actually happening. And, and what we're experiencing uh, is a backlash, uh, a backlash by those who seek to take advantage of people's anxiety uh, and people's alienation in an attempt to roll back uh, uh, the strengthening of democracy, the strengthening of rights, and, and the strengthening of opportunities. In some ways, we're, we're paying the inevitable price of, of progress. It is a difficult moment though. And so even though we're winning, right? I, I wanna be clear, the things we do in this moment uh, really matter. And particularly in, in the sense of, has Rachel described uh, the moment that we are in a moment where uh, paramilitaries are manipulating anxiety around uh, gun safety in order to build uh, their movements grounded on exclusion. Uh, we are seeing an increase. We can go to the next slide now. Um, so, and we can advance. This is Western State Center, right? I should talk a little bit about Western State Center. Uh, we're a 30 year old civil rights institution based out of Portland, Oregon, uh, that works to strengthen democracy. And we do that through three pillars of work, building movements, developing leaders, shifting culture, and defending democracy. Next slide. So I want to get a little bit into this moment. We are seeing an increase in the personal targeting of, of public figures, uh, electeds, right? Uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, civil rights leaders, health officials, uh, bureau land management, you name it. Uh, uh, whether we're talking about civil rights leaders or whether we're talking about government figures and employees, they're under the radar right now. Anti-democratic and far-right groups have upped their level of targeting of elected officials and other state workers in the past year. It has been accelerated by the pandemic COVID-19. Events taking place outside of the homes of electeds is now fairly commonplace. Threats against elected officials, uh, such as the horrendous attempted kidnapping of, and killing of Michigan Governor Whitmer, uh, the plot to do so is one example of that. But also over the weekend in, in Alabama, there was the targeting of a, of a state elected uh, uh, through gun violence, uh, an attempt to, to uh, harm them uh, through firing weapons uh, into their homes. But it isn't just elected officials, right? Health workers, school superintendents, OSHA inspectors continue to be threatened for carrying out their jobs. One example uh, is OSHA and uh, its mandate to respond to restaurants and bars not abiding by COVID-19 uh, lockdown and business measures. Far-right groups have clashed with OSHA workers at the site of many of these businesses. But I also think of Spokane and Spokane County Health Officer Bob Lutz, who has had to endure protest outside of his home, where protesters were sw uh, wrote swastikas in chalk uh, at the sidewalk adjacent to his home. With this in mind, it's important for us to understand that democratic institutions, civic institutions, particularly government, need to take this threat seriously and begin to take efforts that protect their workers 
from this type of illegal intimidation, but to also understand that it's not merely protecting workers through laws, that we have to engage in democracy building to help communities stand in opposition to anti-democratic attacks. I spent uh, some time looking through some data and I came up with a quote from um, Andra uh, Gillespie. She's a political science professor at Emory University in Atlanta. And she said this, right, that the growing disenchantment with, with the political process is fueled by widespread misinformation and that it can breed political violence and insurrection. She then asked, will people who feel disaffected simply not show up in elections and become kind of indifferent to, to everything? She said, or should we begin to contend uh, with the reality that they are more likely to be engaged and uh, compelled to engage in other forms of political activity that includes violent destabilization? Next slide. We begin to see that destabilization through an increasing coalescing between white nationalists and paramilitary groups. Data indicates that right now, uh, to provide one example, US military personnel have been involved in a growing number of domestic terrorist plots and attacks. The percentage of attacks and plots committed by active duty and reserve personnel rose in 2020 to 6.4% of all attacks and plots. I want you to note that that 6.4% increase in 2020, right, and compare it to the 1.5% in 2019 and none recorded in 2018. It is clear that active military personnel and reserves are making up a significant portion of those engaging in paramilitary and white nationalist violence. The data also indicates that it's not military personnel alone, that increasingly uh, uh, law enforcement, right, involvement in attacks are significant. Today, the Seattle, uh, the city of Seattle will release its report, right, on a number of law enforcement officers who attended the January 6th insurrection in Washington. That is merely one example uh, of this type of engagement. This information should serve as a cautionary tell. There's also some other notable data sets, right? Which is that it's not just military personnel and law enforcement beginning to engage in this paramilitary activity, but that they are also becoming increasingly the victims, right? Of this type of violent firearm and extremism crossover. This is despite, right? The increasing relationship of some law enforcement officers within the ranks of extremists. We can all reflect on the prime example in this country, which is on January 6th at the nation's capital, over 140 law enforcement officers were physically injured uh, by those extremists uh, seeking to uh, disrupt uh, the constitutional election process in this country. We have to understand that this coalescing has been happening increasingly over the last 18 months. And we saw it most distinctly here in our region during the reopen protest, right? Anti-Bureau uh, land management protest, right? The stop the steal rallies, uh, ultimately the January 6th insurrection, but it is still happening today. And, and we can now move to the next side. The photo, uh, we can move to the next slide, but the photo you are leaving right now uh, was a picture of the Cresswell event last week featuring the Proud Boys and also paramilitary figures who have increasingly come together, right? And I wanna take a second to talk a little bit about why that coalescing and that bridge building is beginning to happen in this moment. Again, as I said in the beginning, some of the reactions and events that we are experiencing are because of activities and steps we make on our side. In short, if you're a big Marvel nerd like I am and uh, you watch uh, Spider-Man obsessively uh, and you grew up on Spider-Man comic books, one thing you know uh, is that uh, with uh, um, great powers come great responsibility. Uh, as my dad used to say, no good deed goes unpunished. <clears throat> In the work to create communities that are accessible, uh, that provide opportunity, that are safe, we will continue to face backlash. And it is in this backlash uh, that this coalition is happening. Specifically, after January 6th, 
the Department of Justice launched a significant criminal investigation of those engaging in the extremism that happened in the nation's capital on that day. Uh, it has resulted in the arrest of paramilitary leaders from around the country and additional pressure on many of their organizations. As the Proud Boys have devolved as an organization, uh, as the Oath Keepers and others come increase legal pressure, what you will begin to see is the splintering and the reforming of organizations. While the Proud Boys found it in their political benefit to try to clamp down on the overt racism and anti-Semitism within their movement, there is now little benefit to them in this moment. This is why you're beginning to see some of the opening uh, embracement. In short, we must remember that these groups are not anti-government. They are merely anti-government, a government, right? Anti-government that actually speaks to the needs of all of its residents. It's also important for us to understand Right, that these groups are happy to work within the current system in order to disrupt it. So what do we do in this moment? I wanna offer three things that I hope you all might think about in terms of how we begin to regain ground and re-civilize our region. The first is this, we have to understand the link between gendered violence right, and gun violence in this country and in our region. There is a direct correlation between the rise of extremist paramilitary violence in our country and in our region, right, within our states, right, and the domestic and the problem of domestic violence that often precedes it. This is a good point of entry for both state and local governments, and it is a, uh, a, an opportunity for local and regional government to work with one another to advance this issue. The second is, is that we have to begin to contend with what do we do with extremists who are within government agencies. They break down the trust between community and government. We have to begin to encourage uh, government at, from the state to local level to begin to engage with labor unions. There needs to be a joint strategic plan between government and the labor unions that represent employees on how to begin to address this issue. Left unchecked, right? What we find is that government is providing many times uh, uh, without even understanding uh, space for extremist organizing within our communities. We saw this during the wildfires where video lifted up of, of a deputy, of a sheriff's deputy giving instructions to an armed uh, paramilitary group who had set up a checkpoint, checking, uh, asking for the IDs of individuals leaving and entering the fire zone, right, with weapons by their side on how not to get in trouble or to break the law while doing and engaging in this intimidating factor. We have to begin to shift the curve there. And that means uh, uh, labor and government coming together. The third is simply this to understand that we need much more data on what's happening uh, in our communities, uh, much more links between uh, gun violence and other forms of political violence and other forms of crime. I think often of a, of a study that I'll be happy to share uh, with folks later uh, that shows that there's a direct link uh, between the rise of political violence by extremists, right? And then the subsequent rise of, of crime in a community. And that uh, what we often do is address the crime without addressing some of the underlying reasons. It is not surprising in a place like the city of Portland where I reside, right, that we have both witnessed five years of paramilitary violence and now a subsequent rise in, in other forms of crime. It's a process of destabilization that we have to begin to push back from, but we can't do it unless we are in conversation with one another both uh, uh, as nonprofits, but most importantly, uh, government. So thank you for that time and I'll turn it over. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I had like 10 questions, um, but in order to keep things moving, I'm gonna have to um, hand the mic over to Pete. Um, so Pete Holmes is in his third term as Seattle city attorney. He is the only elected city attorney in Washington state. Um, and he supervises an office of over 200 legal professionals and is a founding member of Prosecutors Against Gun Violence. Um, he was also a member of the uh, city 
of Seattle, um, the police department's first civilian oversight body. We do have one of those in Portland as well. Um, Pete is the city of Seattle's misdemeanor prosecutor and he's been closely involved in local legislative efforts to advance and promote firearm safety. I know he's gonna talk about that intersection of guns and domestic violence um, as Eric was alluding to. Um, so thank you, Pete, for joining us. It's my pleasure, Jen. Thank you for that kind introduction and thanks for everyone, everyone for participating. Uh, this is one of those great stories that I wanted to tell you the dream of every prosecutor is not always having to come after a crime has been committed, but rather to prevent violence. That's uh, why this is, a, this is a hopeful story that I hope to share. We are trying to spread our experience across the country and I have some good examples for you. We're incredibly proud of our regional domestic violence uh, firearms enforcement unit and understand that it arose first off uh, out of a broken promise. For years, we've had on the books in wa Washington state, the promise that a civil surrender order could be obtained by a woman facing uh, you know, the threat of harm in a, in a, in a broken relationship. And once a, a domestic violence crime had been committed and referred to our office, we found that more often than not, the, the, the victim would say, there was an order. He never submit, he never surrendered his weapons. So under the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the model of it's better to ask forgiveness than permission, uh, our domestic violence unit, the, the prosecutors and the advocates in that unit came together with a proposal that we, we, we made to uh, some select officers in our Seattle Police Department we sent prosecutors over to the civil court to hear the returns on these civil protection orders in cases that we were aware of. And we saw abject uniform non-compliance. And we said, what if, what if we take those orders and involve a police officer and then, uh, and then find out whether or not they have actually complied with the terms of those orders. That's how all of this started as a pilot project in 2017. And from that pilot project, we were able to demonstrate some incredible results. We, we then reached out, our city council was, was very supportive, showing some pictures of some of the weapons that we retrieved was quite compelling. But uh, we, we then reached out uh, to the county because we understood that gun violence certainly doesn't, doesn't respect uh, city boundaries. And we reached out to the broader county. We got additional funding in 2018. And uh, by 2019, we had recovered, I look at my numbers here, uh, some 1,100 guns in one single year, in the year 2019, enforcing these uh, civil surrender orders. And it's been our, our uh, uh, partnership uh, and support, frankly, from the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and the unique collaboration uh, between the practitioners and researchers in the field of gun violence that has just simply been invaluable. And that's what has guided our efforts. Uh, Chelsea, if we could have the next slide, please. As I said, uh, we now have, uh, this started under existing law and then in 2017, uh, Washington voters enacted uh, initiative 1491. We now have the ability to have so-called red flag orders or uh, ERPOs, the extreme risk protection orders. And so not only is this unit available to enforce in the domestic violence context, but more broadly, we can actually enforce ERPOs when they have been sought by uh, friends and families of someone that they that they believe to be troubled and it potentially uh, at risk of doing violence with a with a weapon. Uh, next slide, Jen. Please don't hesitate to remind me if I'm getting out of uh, if I'm out of time. Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> so let's face it. Uh, it takes money to run successful programs, and the key to the success of this in firearms enforcement unit has been funding and. Uh, it's, you know, you can issue all the surrender orders you want, but unless they're enforced, they, they are just meaningless pieces of paper. And it's a broken promise to the victims. And, and we've learned though that this, this system really works. We had a, a, an example just a few years ago where we had seen in the, in the media that one high school student had threatened to shoot another high school student. We were able to see the individuals just simply through the media. We reached out to the parents of the threatened child and advised them of the ability to get an ERPO. We helped them to get an ERPO 
And then when we executed that order on the, uh, on the family of the, of the uh, student who made the threat, uh, we did have an adjudication that went through the process. Uh, there were second amendment challenges, but ultimately we brought attention to the problem. Uh, violence was averted and uh, they, the, the gun owner ultimately, the father ultimately got his gun back but uh, that, that threat was averted and it, and it really, I think, put a further spotlight on the availability of this relief. How about the next slide, please, uh, Chelsea? So it can go beyond jurisdictions. And this is where I think that it's so meaningful for a lot of the frankly alarming information that we've learned today from the prior two speakers. Um, we know that there are white supremacists in our country and that they are gaining uh, traction through social media and the like. The Northwest is not only not an exception, but one of the, one of the places where it seems to be particularly taking hold. Uh, Adumwasa was uh, an, an example of one. This is uh, some of the members from, the, from Washington state that were posing, posing in front of Auschwitz. Uh, they had a, an extremely hate-filled message of violence against Jews and people of color. And not only that, they were assembling arms, conducting training and, and uh, distributing literature that was hate-filled and encouraging what we, we now know to be the accelerationist movements. These are white supremacists who are intent on, ex on uh, furthering and speeding up what they see as an inevitable race war in this country. This is scary stuff. Next slide, please, Chelsea. So one day, uh, the FBI approached us here in Seattle because they had, they had learned about uh, Caleb Cole, the leader of Adamasa up in Marysville, north of Seattle, in another county north of us. But because of our uh, you know, ability to transcend jurisdictions within the state of Washington, we were able to work with them, obtain an ERPO, using the information that FBI agents had collected, identify the likely uh, location of these weapons, what was there, and then uh, were able to get, again, the civil order, not a criminal order, a civil order that they be surrendered. Working with officers from the Seattle Police Department who are experienced, our prosecutors and police together working in concert working in concert with federal authorities, were able to go and seize this arsenal. Later, Mr. Cole and another associate was arrested down in Texas. You may have followed this. He was extradited from Texas back to Washington and was just a few weeks ago sentenced, I believe, to five years in federal prison uh, for violating uh, the, the order and taking weapons across uh, state lines, among, among other uh, violations. Uh, next slide, please. And I realize I'm coming up on my allotted time. These are some of the some of the uh, the guns that we've collected in uh, another mass violence threat. Just to give you an idea, it's chilling. The weapons that we have it, it ranges from everything from um, uh, rocket propelled grenade launchers, uh, explosive devices, as well as uh, extremely uh, lethal weapons that uh, you know, could be really used in any mass event. We could be the, the next Las Vegas. Um, I wanna just uh, wanna point out a couple other quick things because I know we're at time and I wanna, I wanna make sure we leave some time for questions. But you know, red flag laws, these ERPOs are not the second amendment boogeyman that, uh, that uh, these uh, gun lovers uh, have feared. Uh, even Lindsey Graham, hosted members of our team in the Senate, in the US Senate, to hear about the success of this program. And so we have been very careful to make sure that we uh, uh, stayed within the confines of the Second Amendment. These are in, in, in action, reaction to uh, clear and present threats. And uh, one of the things that we can elaborate on further and follow up to this is that we know that, for instance, the nature of the threat itself is really important when you get this ERPO order. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that you know, a specific threat against somebody or uh, a group that's posted online might actually have some First Amendment protections. But when, but when specific acts of violence uh, are, um, are identified with specific measures and steps being taken, that's the kind of particularized information that can lead to an ERPO that we can enforce. 
So uh, I guess next slide, uh, Chelsea, and I'll, and I'll wrap this up. Uh, you know, open carry uh, is, is one, of the, one of the problems that we have been confronting in our urban areas. Um, we, even though we have anti-militia laws, it's, uh, it's a challenge uh, to watch the intersection of First and Second Amendment challenges. And frankly, it's state law preemption that is, remains my biggest uh, target, frankly, uh, to try and roll back the restrictions that urban areas like Seattle face when they're trying to enact common sense gun protection laws. Fortunately, in the last session of the legislature, uh, our, um, in Olympia, we, we passed a bill in 2021 to prohibit open carry of firearms in the state capitol building and also at or near permitted demonstrations. I'll close by saying that we, we've been successful in, for instance, when the Proud Boys petitioned for a, a demonstration permit, we, it's, it's very important that they not be content limited. We, we respect the First Amendment. But we have been able through imposition of permit terms to make sure that demonstrations are held in a place where it's safe, where they can be contained and where we can keep counter demonstrators at a distance. These have been extremely successful in Seattle. And uh, again, I'm happy to answer any questions. How was that, Lynn? Did I go very, uh, Jen, did I go very far over? <laughs> no, it's okay. We are running a little behind um, and I'm gonna bring Stephanie back um, because we do wanna make sure we have time um, to ask questions. I know I have a few. Um, and uh, yeah, Stephanie. Sure. Well, I know, Rachel, at the end of your presentation, you were starting to allude to tools and strategies um, that the Southern Poverty Law Center recommends. So I'm wondering if you could share some of those quickly with us um, and how we might follow up on them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to think through what we think might work, right? What, um, and, and we also spend some time now, we have a 501c4 um, where we are able to sort of talk to lawmakers and try to tell them uh, what we think would be the best uh, way forward. So um, very quickly, just some of the things that I am gonna mention. We also mentioned to Congress very specifically the House and Homeland Security uh, Committee had a, there was a hearing on violent militias. And so we wanted to ensure that they understood um, not just what they were and why they were a threat, but also what they could potentially do about it. These aren't all suggestions that are just on the federal level. There are definitely suggestions for the state level, the county level, city level, um, and just things that all of us can sort of work to push for. Um, and in fact, one of the very first things that we had talked about was firearms um, in particular. And so it was to restrict access to firearms for extremists. So we found that 59% uh, of domestic terrorist attacks that were carried out just between April of 2009 and February of 2015 were perpetrated uh, with a gun. That's, that's a huge number um, and that, Basically, it has to stop. Um, and so we are looking to try to find ways to do that. So we expect the federal and state officials should adopt reasonable gun violence prevention initiatives um, to help prevent violent extremists from acquiring weapons. Um, so, you know, really appreciate Pete and what you're doing. Thank you. Um, we also believe in the enforcement of current paramilitary laws. These laws uh, across the country, there are laws that essentially keep people from going out and either um, acting as a paramilitary, um, which means carrying guns on the street, right? Having uniforms, possibly uh, coming out and looking as if they were military when they are in fact not. And so we believe that every state that has these laws, they actually need to enforce them, which is not done very often at all. Um, and the, a federal law needs to be created as well in relation to paramilitaries coming out and intimidating people on the street. Um, we also think that uh, violent militias and other extremist groups, they need to be investigated and prosecuted every single time um, that there are activities that they're involved in, uh, specifically when they're related, right, to firearms and dangerous weapons. So, you know, we're, we're thankful in Michigan, I'm sure we're all aware of the plot against Governor Whitmer 
um, there was really a great effort by local to federal law enforcement to investigate all of the men that were involved. Um, going back to sort of Eric's point, these are all men. <laughs> um, there really are issues that are related sometimes to toxic, toxic masculinity and domestic violence that need to be investigated farther. Um, and thankfully, these men are behind bars now um, as a result of that effort. We also think um, that federal hate crime data collection um, needs to essentially increase. Like we can't, we need to have it. Um, the FBI's annual hate crime statistics is sort of the best snapshot that there is and it's not enough. It's not even close to enough. Um, so we would like to see that change. There's just a couple more things. There's really a million things, but um, the other ones that we think are extremely, extremely important are that public officials and other influencers need to speak out against hate and extremism. Um, their words matter. Um, and, and being influential means that people are listening to your words. And so if, if these people are willing to speak out and say, this is not okay, right? And, and to do it in a way that also is supporting things like what uh, Pete is doing in Seattle, that is extremely, extremely important to shed some light on it, right? To talk about why it's beneficial, why, why it's something that we need to be doing in order to curb not just extremism in general, but just all forms of violence. Um, and very lastly, we need to fund prevention initiatives that steer individuals away from hate and extremism. So currently SPLC is working on a project um, called the Peril Project. And we're working to ensure that especially youth do not become exploited and radicalized into extremism. Um, you can find any of that information on our website. We're working with American University on that. Um, but more generally, we and we also have a learning for justice program that gives, uh, we help with curriculum that really talks about the real history of the United States, including native land, for instance. Um, and we think that being able to teach anti-racist education, just really factual education about our history can help also to keep youth from being radicalized and de-radicalize any youth that already are moving toward that path um, and may unfortunately end up in a, a situation where they are using firearms or other weapons uh, to hurt people. So that's, that's what I have to share for you today. Really appreciate that, Rachel. And it feels like so much of what you listed is truly actionable, are right? things that we can continue or get started on in our own communities. So I really, really appreciate that overview. Um, as I was listening to the presentations, I was wondering, you know, I've only spent 35, almost 36 years on this planet. Um, so I'm always, always sort of curious about the historical context of things. And I'm wondering, Eric, um, Thank you for your deep analysis, first of all, but I'm wondering, Eric, if you could speak to whether we've been in this moment before um, and if we should expect uh, moments like this where the you know, tensions feel particularly high to pass or if we actually you know, do, or if the reason they pass is because people take action and pursue some of the strategies um, that Rachel is mentioning. So here's here's what we know, Stephanie. We we know that uh, we have been in moments like this, but I don't think we've ever been in a moment exactly uh, like this. This this is a significant moment. Uh, uh, the last time we probably, as a country, have experienced a moment like this was preceding the Civil War, right? Uh, I don't want to draw a direct comparison there. Uh, but what I mean is that we are in a moment where the country is redefining uh, what it means to be an American. And uh, those have been very volatile moments uh, in the United States. But look, there are some things that we can do that can help our communities right, get through this moment. And one of the things we have to understand is that in these moments where it appears that government is weakened, right, or, or weak, is not the main uh, player on the terrain, uh, what we begin to see is an increase of political violence and an increase of crime. In a country where weapons are so prolific that violence uh, takes the form of, of gun violence. So what we need to do is to, is to really begin uh, uh, to push back. Government has to do this, right? Nonprofits aren't big enough for 
uh, this problem. You know, a suggestion is this, right? Those engaged in acts of violent, right? Polit you know, physical, political violence should not be allowed, right? To, to have a weapon, right? That is, the, that, is what, that is the right you lose when you engage in physical political violence. And that is the type of conversation we need to have. And it's not just guns, right? Increasingly, what we know is that vehicles are being used, right? Uh, as, as weapons themselves. We allow people to drive through our towns and cities with darkened windows, right? Suspensions that have been lifted up clearly, right? To intimidate people and pedestrians on the streets. Uh, no front or back uh, uh, car tax. And uh, we are then surprised that then these vehicles are then used in this way. We have to strip away the anonymity, right? And to make people more transparent including extremists. And when they engage in political violence, there needs to be significant rights that become restricted. And I don't say that uh, theoretically, right? I honestly say this. I'm a person who's been an organizer for a very, very long time, right? And I don't say this out of pride, but I say this as someone who grew up in the midst of that political violence, right? When you engage in that type of political violence, there needs to be a cost that's paid. And that, can't, that cost can't be paid right, unless there's strong government involved. Um, Eric, I greatly appreciate that um, point about not nonprofits not being big enough to take this on. Um, and I know, you know, so many of us on the phone are um, affiliated with, uh, you know, nonprofits and other NGOs that are, uh, have been out and at this. I know some of you on the line have been at this for years. Um, and, uh, and I think this, you know, this conversation shows that this intersection between the work that folks like um, our, our Seattle city attorney does and uh, the advocacy that happens at our state legislature are absolutely vital in uh, pushing these concepts across the line. Um, I wanna um, make sure that we end on time today. Um, and I wanna let all of you know that we are so grateful for all of your great questions. Um, and uh, so many great specifics uh, about the, you know, about events that have taken place in the Pacific Northwest. Unfortunately, our our list of um, our list of, you know, relevant situations is getting really long. Uh, you know, going back to um, going back several years, but you know, most recently this, we had our own capital invasion here in Oregon. Uh, if you remember, that that doesn't feel terribly long ago. Um, so we definitely are, are in a time of clear and present danger and everybody's um, attention and, and uh, you know, an interest in this issue is so important um, to keeping it in our headlines. So I wanna thank everybody so much, um, Pete and Rachel and Eric for joining us and for sharing um, your time. And um, I agree, Paula, this was, you know, this, there was so much to talk about uh, and the, the folks at the Washington Alliance ran a similar program um, a couple of months ago with Mary Gordon that I also felt there was just, there's so much energy um, to, from, you know, from so many people who wanted, who really want to push back hard against the, um, this sort of intersection of, of anti-social behavior, anti-government behavior and violence, um, because uh, as we can see, it's not going to go away on its own. It certainly didn't go away with the transition of power. Um, so uh, I want to um, give everybody, uh, you know, my word that we um, will continue the conversation. Uh, we very much appreciate everybody who stepped up to participate today. I want to make sure that you get um, more from these great speakers. We'll send a follow-up note um, uh, with their um, information. And then Stephanie and I will also share our contact information. Um, maybe Stephanie could throw that in the chat if there are more things you want to um, uh, you know, reach out to these guys on, we can either make those connections directly or connect you with some of the resources that the Washington Alliance and Oregon Alliance prepared um, to help, uh, help turn these concepts and your energy into action. Stephanie, anything else? <laughs> No, thank you all for joining us. Um, great questions in the chat. I'm sorry we didn't get to them, but we'll do our best to follow up offline. Thank you for joining us. And have okay, a great take care, day. everybody.